It's the show where Hawaii's newsmakers come to talk and to take your questions live. From the nation's capital to Honolulu Hale, from the state legislature to the fifth floor, we bring the experts to you and ask them what you want to know. Spotlight Hawaii with Yanji Denise and Ryan Palaisuji on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. Good morning. Happy Aloha Friday. Thanks so much for joining us here on Spotlight Hawaii. I'm Yanji Denise, joined by Ryan Kalei Suji, streaming lives on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. Ryan, this morning we are heading over to UH Manoa. That's right. We are going to be catching up and meeting the new man in charge of the athletic department there who uh, is really settling into his role after a, about a month on the job, joining us this morning from Lower Campus is Athletics Director of the University of Hawaii, Craig Angeles. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. Thank you so much for having me. Looking forward to it. You know, there's a lot we want to talk to about the athletic department. Of course, a uh, big season already. A lot of conversations and talk around the community about uh, this upcoming fall sports season. But let's just start off with you, Broad Strokes. How have things been uh, settling into this role for about a month now? Uh, how have things been for you down there at the lower campus? Oh, yeah, it's been great. I've been here. This I'm just finishing my fifth week. Uh, but my goal from the very beginning was to try to get out in the community and meet as many people as I can. And I've, uh, I've accomplished a lot of that so far. Met, met a lot of people, got a lot of advice, asked a lot of questions. I kind of feel like I'm on Jeopardy. I ask everything in the form of a question. Uh, and so it's been good. It's been uh a lot of, lot of support, a lot of people saying they want to help out and see uh, the program do well. So I couldn't be more pleased. Well, you definitely have the you know interest of the community. We all want to see all of those teams do well and the department do well as well. I'm interested to know, coming in with a fresh perspective, what do you see as the big, biggest challenging, challenges facing athletics right now? Well, I think, I think the financial piece is always going to be a, among the top. I mean, certainly we want to take care of our student athletes and you know, in the, in the classroom and the mental health, uh, try to have a first class experience for them. But all that takes resources and not just at Hawaii, but across the country. And that's why you see people changing conferences, realignment, all sorts of things. And it's really for one reason, and that's to try to in, in, increase the, the resources they have. Uh, Hawaii is very fortunate to have to be very much supported by the by the university as well as the state itself. It is the only Division One university in the state and, and there's great support for it. Uh, and so we're very fortunate to have a good solid financial base, but I think that's what they've asked me to do is try to really enhance the uh, revenues coming into the athletic department, find new ways to draw revenue and uh, continue to grow the program. You know, you're coming into this uh, as taking helm of this athletic department and doing what some would say a very critical time, especially when it comes to infrastructure regarding uh, the football team. We all know what's happening with uh, the stadium and the, some of the limitations there. Uh, but let's start off with Aloha Stadium first. What can you tell us? Have you been involved in any of the conversations? Have you been able to speak to officials like the governor or any lawmakers about what the progress or what the future of Aloha Stadium looks like and your involvement and what you would like to see being a tenant, a future tenant of Aloha Stadium. Yeah, I've had a lot of conversations with people uh, as far as what the direction is. Some have been official, some have been not official. I, I've, I mean, I've met the governor. We have a meeting set up in July. Uh, I've, I've met some other uh, officials, but we really haven't talked officially about that. I have attended the first meeting of the stadium authority. Uh, the University of Hawaii has a seat on the, on the, on, at the table as an ex officio member. I went down there for the first meeting last week. Uh, yeah, I think I think the, the what I've been told is uh, is is that, you know, they're going to do an RFQ request for qualifications in December. Let that play out and then do narrow that down to maybe three names and then do a request for proposal, which takes a little time because I've been told that's these groups will spend anywhere from three to four or five million dollars preparing that request for proposal that will come in and then that will be reviewed. And so I think the critical time that I've been told that we're looking at is the summer of 2025. So when we, when we see the 2020, when we get to the summer of 2025, they'll be able to see what kind of proposals uh, that have come to the table, see if they're viable. And I think they feel that they're viable, that they will move forward and with the hope of uh, building a stadium, uh, which would take about two and a half years. And that would be, you know, done sometime in, in 2028. And then the uh, hope to play the first game in the fall of 2028. So that's their timeline. Uh, so, you know, as you know, you've got to 
hit the the benchmarks along the way. And I think that summer of 2025, in my mind, is going to be a critical time to see what the viability of, of, of moving forward will be. In the meantime, are you satisfied with the facilities on campus? Yeah, you know, I've got to really hand it to everybody here, the, the legislature, the university, the athletic department, everybody for pivoting so quickly uh, to then try to build something on campus that's viable. I mean, that just really doesn't happen in college athletics. Usually if you're changing stadiums or whatnot, you have a lot of lead time. You have the next opportunity down there. And then, of course, being on the island makes it much more difficult because if you're on the continent, you have, you, you know, you, you can say, well, we'll go play at a, uh, a soccer stadium down the street or a pro stadium an hour away or something like that. There's always options there, whereas here there's really no other option. So for them to pivot so quickly to put something up has just been nothing short of amazing. And uh, it's right out my window now. There, it's, it's up to 15,300 now for, this, for the first game against Stanford uh, in, in about seven weeks. Uh, and, and to do that on such short notice has been just amazing. So, you know, it's not ideal. I mean, you definitely at the FBS level, we want to have uh, more seating capacity. I'd like to see 30, 35, 40,000. I know that in the heyday, the, the Rainbow Warriors were drawing a lot, of, a lot of fans. Now we can really only draw 15-3 uh, to the games. Uh, and, and think about it. We play some great competition next year, for example, not this year, but next year we start off with UCLA and Oregon coming to, to our stadium out here at 15,000. So it's not ideal. Uh, we've got we've to we've find a way, though, to make it uh, successful for us. And I, I'm sure Timmy will do that, bring the players in. If they do well, uh, you know, we'll continue to, to, to grow the program and, and, uh, and, and you know, try to prepare for the, for the next round of, of 2028 when we go into a bigger stadium. But we've got to – that's five years if you think about it, and that's an eternity in a coach's uh, career. So we've got to find ways to pivot and, and to be successful in the, the surroundings that we have. I think we can do that. Uh, how are you hoping to enhance the, you know, just the fan experience being there? Uh, this is a stadium where, of course, uh, there are its bleacher seats for some. Uh, you know, what the, the athletic department did last year was just trying to find different ways to get people down by having – uh, a concert in the arena to help build up some momentum before that first kickoff game. There were a number of other activations around campus uh, in the baseball stadium and so forth. Uh, do you foresee a uh, continuation or growth of further enhancements for the overall fan experience when attending these football games on campus? Yeah, most definitely. I think there's no playbook on how to, how to, to do this at such short notice in such a smaller stadium, but we do know how to provide a good in-game experience. I, I haven't been involved with our marketing team and our external team as as much just in my first five weeks on that. But I know they're working closely at it, trying to just learn from, you know, what's worked last year and the, the year before and, and what we need to do to continue to enhance it. And that's what I would like to do, too, is once I get involved in seeing what it is on a game day experience, you know, I have my own ideas, too, that I can bring to the table that I've, that I've seen maybe work at other places, too. So, you know, the new scoreboard came over from Aloha Stadium. So that's going to be it's already set up and that's that's looking really nice right now. But we'll continue to have, you know, fan zones. Uh, in, the in-game experience is going to be huge. We've got to theme our games. You know, uh, our students, are, we got 1,500 student seats on campus here. Uh, and, and being on campus, I think we'll fill those up. And they'll, the bozos, as they call themselves now, uh, the, uh, they're the student group in the, in, uh, the, that will bring a lot of energy to the table. So I think, you know, we will have the, 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 uh, the, the opportunities to engage with the fans outside the stadium, you know, use uh, less more kami to as an overflow uh just to try to do as many different things as we can so we have meetings every week to talk about how we're going to do that but there's logistical challenges too like going up from nine thousand to fifteen thousand you got to bring in a lot more uh, bathroom stalls uh you know concessions and there's just not a big footprint to do that so it's 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 very challenging but i think the the group here has been very willing to to step up and and, and make it happen but to your point We've got to be flexible. We got to see what we can do. Continue to add things. We're adding new premium seating opportunities. Heck, I'm even looking at my athletic director suite and seeing if we can, you know, create revenue by that. And maybe I don't use it, and maybe I, uh, you know, uh, sell that on a game by game basis to to a group of people that want to do that. So we're trying to find different ways to to drive revenue uh, in, in such a small stadium, but also uh, but also have a, a really good in game fan experience. 
I want to bring in a question and and this and also just talk about facilities broadly. Warrior All Access has a question this morning. Could you renovate or replace Club Gym into a performance facility? What's your take on the uh, facilities broadly beyond uh, football uh, on campus and what changes would you like to see? Well, I think I wrote that question and sent it in because that's exactly what I've been talking about <laughs> is that Club Gym seems to be an, an opportunity to maybe uh, build something new there. And I think with the football program, you know, we've got to continue to make ourselves relevant. And as you see, our competitors are always doing this, these facilities master plans and trying to say, how can we renovate these facilities? And if you look at our place, we've got really nice, uh, 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 you know, arena, baseball field, softball field, swimming pool, some of those things. But I do think we could refresh those areas and then also maybe build new. And to his point about Club Gym, uh, that's an area that I'm looking at to try to do a performance center. Uh, I think we already have someone to name the performance center for us. Uh, we are currently in the process of doing a facilities master plan that we just started up right now. And we're going to mirror what, you know, other competitors, Boise State, uh, Fresno State, San Diego State have done by taking a holistic look at our facilities to say, you know, how can we raise those up to be a, a top uh, flight facility? And so, yeah, that Clump Gym area will be, uh, well, what I'm hoping will be after we do a facilities master plan, uh, some type of performance center, first class performance center that will, you know, really assist in our football program and other programs too. So if we have, you know, our, our temporary stadium, we have a nice, but we build a nice performance center, you know, and then look to build a, you know, get to our new stadium. I think there's hope that we're growing this program and being being relevant on the landscape. One other way to stay relevant, of course, is just being able to keep up with the changing dynamics of college athletics as a whole. And a, a lot of things are changing uh, throughout the NCAA, specifically when it comes to name, image, and likeness and the NIL ruling that has just come through uh, just a few years ago with college athletes now being able to make money off of their name, image, and likeness, something that was prohibited in the past. Uh, how does the University of Hawaii stay competitive in this recruiting process while trying to uh, note that there are other institutions throughout the country that have an NIL director within their athletic program that specifically looks for deals for these athletes to help provide supplemental income outside of their scholarships. Uh, is this something that you foresee the University of Hawaii potentially doing? And, and your thoughts overall on how NIL is changing the collegiate landscape, specifically with the University of Hawaii? Well, how it's relating across the landscape has just been incredible. I mean, it's, you know, I, I like it into pro sports now is that, there, but there's no salary cap uh, and there's no, you know, hard and fast rules. So, so it's a, it's a total shift where we've been, you know, five, 10, 20 years ago now, but again, those are the new rules of the game. And so anytime a sport changes their rules or, or the association changes their rules, we've got to be able to play at the highest level and maximize those rules. Uh, and so, yeah, the, the NIL now, uh, you know, schools are, uh, for the viewers, you know, they've developed these collectives. Uh, the schools haven't developed the collectives, but donors are able to develop a collective, what they call a collective, in which they can solicit uh, money from uh, businesses and whatnot. And then they go out and they try to pre present this money to these student athletes. Uh, and, and in return, the student athletes, you know, do some type of uh, promotional products or promotional uh, activities for this organization or business, you know, sign autographs, uh, make appearances, do social media posting, things of that kind of thing, all sorts of things in return uh, for using their name, image and likeness to promote that commercial product. They get they get money. And uh, and the bigger schools, the power five schools, those collectives are millions and millions of dollars. A lot of student athletes are getting hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars uh, to to come to those particular schools uh, all under the name of NIL. And uh, and so we've got to be able to be competitive in that field uh, to the extent that we can. And and so we're trying to maximize it as much as possible. There are there have been two collectives that have been started by uh, donor groups here in town, the the Rainbow or the Downtown Athletic Club. And I believe uh, the or Downtown Athletic Club Collective. And I think the Rainbow Collective is another one uh, that have worked with our sports and, and whatnot to try to uh, help student athletes. Uh, receive these NIL deals. So it is really transformational in the in the industry. We don't have a NIL coordinator now. Now, keep in mind, a lot of states have developed uh, two years ago, July 1st, where a lot of states had finalized their NIL legislation, which kind of limited uh, various things at various schools, like the, sc the school I was at in the past, the state legislation limited the school's involvement in creating these deals. Uh, uh, 
Hawaii does not have any state legislation as it relates to NIL. And there's a handful of states that Denver did create legislation regarding NIL, which is probably good because that creates more flexibility for us. So that notion has been talked about is, is, is do we have an NIL coordinator that can just be a, a, a conduit uh, with the collectives, the coaches and others to, to abide by the NCAA rules, but also try to, to create opportunities for these student athletes. And so it is what it is. We've got to be able to uh, attract good student athletes and that will actually help us do that. And we also got to be able to retain our good student athletes because if we have great players uh, and we're not able to com be competitive in that area, then because of the transfer portal, they'll be picked off by a Pac-12 school who will say, why don't you come over here? You know, you were all conference in, in, in at, at, uh, Hawaii. Why don't you come over here, though? We'll pay you X amount of dollars under the NIL. And so they're basically able to pay them to come to greener pastures and pay them more money. Now, I don't know if we'll ever get to the point where we can compete with the SEC and Big 12 money, things of that nature. But we do want to be able to compete with our conference. And, and do the best we can. So there's, you know, there's a lot of support here on the island, uh, you know, for the athletic department, for NIL deals, uh, but we just got to continue to maximize it. And to the UV viewers who want to be involved, we want your involvement too. The more, the better. Well, I mean, when you think about that, what you're, you know, that scenario where you're talking about bigger schools being able to poach athletes, it, it does seem like a situation where Hawaii perhaps cannot ever compete on that scale. So what are, what are the other X factors that you do for the program to make a student athlete want to stay in Hawaii, even if there is potentially a bigger payday somewhere else? Yeah. And it's a good point. I mean, we, we can poach to a certain extent, great players that are maybe playing a little lesser level than we are. And, and if they're an all American at this other level, we can say, come up and play for us. Cause if you can play here, you can, you know, you can play for us. So we can do a certain amount of that, but we won't be able to compete with Georgia and, and those others for those great athletes. Uh, and as you know, there's a lot of great athletes coming out of, out of Hawaii, but we do have a lot of things to offer. I mean, we do live in Hawaii and, and Hawaii is, you know, a marquee place around the world. Everybody wants to come visit Hawaii and hopefully come play for us. So I think to kind of offset the, the inability to maybe compete at the highest level of collectives, we've got to be good in other areas. So we, we inherently have, you know, a great place to come and, and live, uh, live on the, on the Island here and be part of, part of uh, the culture and, uh, and the weather and whatnot. But we also have to have great facilities. So when they come here, you know, kids buy with their eyes, they say, well, if I can have this or this, for the same price, you know, they're going to, they're going to gravitate towards great facilities. So we got to have great facilities, great coaches, a great culture, uh, and, 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 and hope, you know, the university and the, and the, 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 the state of Hawaii, uh, being a great place to live. We've got to accentuate those things. And Timmy's doing a really good job in, in football, because I mean, think about it, he is that favorite son who has done this, who's, who lived here, went to St. Louis, stayed home, uh, was successful. And, and hopefully he, that message will, be heated by a lot of our top athletes so they don't feel like they have to go to the continent to play that they can stay here even though they may not be making as much money the culture the family setting staying at home having great facilities to play in a great fan base a rabid fan base this is as good as anywhere in the country hopefully those things can kind of offset the the need to just take chase the money i want to talk a little bit about chasing that money uh, uh in this segue here because you know one of the things and, and some of the criticism maybe that you faced when this announcement came out is that you didn't have uh, a lot of connections in the downtown area or with some of these corporate players that significantly impact the program through donations uh how have you tried to bridge that gap uh in order to help and to, and to make sure and uh, that the athletic program continues to be, uh, you know, supported financially through these corporate donors. Uh, and then also factoring in, tying in back to NIL, uh, you know, there is some hesitation that NIL could take away some of the money that has been allocated specifically for corporate sponsorship to support the athletic department uh, that may now trickle down to the athletes specifically from that same budget. So how, how do you find that balance with trying to maintain those corporate sponsorships and, and how have you been trying to reach out to maintain these relationships? Right. Well, your first question, I've been eating a lot of breakfast, lunches and dinners and receptions. Yesterday, I had two breakfasts, one at 630 and one at 730, a lunch, a dinner, a reception. Uh, so that was like a full a full day there. But you know, I've, I've really made an effort to try to get to meet all the, 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 the people that I can in the city. A lot of the people that are donating to our program who are involved, people who are in uh, important positions that can be influential with us. So I and I've met many of them. 
and we'll continue to meet many of them and trying to meet with our legislature uh, and, and other, uh, the governor and the uh, lieutenant governor and uh, just a number of uh, people that I think have a real vested interest in the program. So, you know, I, even though I didn't grow up here, I do believe that they, they want to, to see someone in this position that can bring some leadership and some vision and some, some get some things done. So it's kind of like a coach, you know, no matter where you come from, if you win, they'll like you. Uh, if you don't win, then they'll want to get rid of you. And I think athletic directors are the same kind of thing there, uh, even though it's hard to measure our wins and losses, you know, uh, like on Saturday. But but we will definitely find wins. And, and hopefully I can prove to them that, uh, you know, I can bring that leadership to the table and get some things done. And I think we already have with, you know, just in the short amount of time, finding new revenue sources through premium seating opportunities and other creative opportunities that were, you know, I think we can probably bring, you know, just in the last five weeks, just trying to work with our staff to find more premium seating, things of that nature to the two in football, basketball, men's and women's volleyball to the tune of, you know, upwards to $400,000 in new revenue. I was just talking to our guy today. Can you calculate what that projected to be? So we're chasing that even to the point of me selling my suite on a day on a game by game basis, uh, instead of just entertaining uh, donors, you know, sell it to donors who want to do that and bring in that kind of money too, and make those kind of sacrifices, if you will, instead of me sitting on the 50 yard line, let someone else sit on the 50 yard line, but pay for it, of course. So I'm all in to hit it as hard as I can uh, and to try to make things happen. And I think off to a pretty good start. But back to the your second question about the NILs uh, opportunities dipping into some of these other things. You're exactly right. I mean, a donor, if they're giving us fifty thousand uh, dollars for for something, they might be saying to athletics, they might be saying, well, you know what? I want to get help the NILs. I want to help the collectives. So I'll tell you what, I'm going to give you twenty five thousand and I'm going to take another twenty five thousand and give it to the collectives. And you're as an athletic director, like, oh, yeah, that's great. You know, that's that's great. We want to help these people. But when you're driving home, you're like, wait, I just lost twenty five thousand dollars this year from that donor. How am I going to recoup that? And the same with corporate sponsors. We have Learfield, who runs our corporate sponsorship division. And, you know, I can see I don't know if we've really seen it as much lately, but I can see if you're a, uh, you know, a 7-Eleven who's doing a fifty thousand dollar corporate sponsorship with us. And now you say, well, I'd like the university signage and that kind of packaging, but I think I'm only going to do 25 for them. And then I'm going to use student athletes, uh, you know, through collectives for another twenty five thousand to help them. Uh, promote my product at, at you know 7-Eleven that kind of thing and so you're right there it is dipping into the university's athletic department's resources as well as to our corporate sponsorship packages uh, it's that third element being added having said that it's all we just have one pot of money though we just have our our I don't know how many donors we have on the island uh, and so we're going to hit donor fatigue where they're going to say wait you want me to do a sponsorship you want me to donate to the athletic program and you also want me to you know, help with the collectives, there's only so much money to go around. So no doubt it will have an effect to what it, to what level, I don't know, but we want to be, we want to be good in all three of those areas for sure. We want to be good in all three of those areas. So my hope is that we can expand our donor base and get more people coming to the table that are interested in us than we all three, you know, continue to thrive. I'm interested just on a personal level, you know, you talked about student athletes and, and their love for Hawaii and the draw of this place. Uh, given those breakfast, lunch and dinners and the receptions, how much of this place have you gotten to experience? Do you have any favorites yet? I know it's early days and just how the move is going for you and for your family. Well, I've got some great restaurants like Signature Steakhouse is one of my favorites. I got to tell you, uh, Zippy's. I, gotta, I go to Zippy's quite a bit, too, uh, when you need something quick or the Pacific Club. Uh, so a lot of great places I've learned, but I haven't got too far away from this, I don't know, five or 10 mile radius, because uh, that's all I do every day. Uh, uh, but yeah, it's it's been a great experience here to be on the island. I mean, the people have been great. You know, I love the tropical weather. We we, we live many years in Florida, so we're really used to the tropical weather. But it's Hawaii, it's even better because there's not as much humidity as there is in Florida. Uh, but But I think the people are what make it. You know, uh, I can live anywhere uh, as long as, you know, as long as I, you know, love what I do and, and there's good people around. And that's what we have here. It's great people. Uh, and and so, uh, you know, I, I'm really enjoying it so far and, and trying to trying to do the best I can. But uh, but the people have been really good and very supportive. So uh, I, I, I'm hope I'm hopeful about our future. I want to bring in another question from Spencer, who's asking, would you consider bringing all UH sports to the NWC, the Mountain West Conference? Uh, and just speaking broadly about conference shakeups that are continue to happen uh, each and every year, 
uh, of course, what's happening with the Pac-12 and, and just where you, the University of Hawaii is with sports playing in multiple conferences. Uh, what is your overall thought about the conference landscape uh, and, and where Hawaii falls into that, noting that, uh, you know, there are some who are hesitant about the University of Hawaii being a part of their conference because of its geographical location and travel restrictions. Uh, how do you stay competitive in this area and your thoughts overall about Hawaii's future when it comes to conference? Well, to his, to his question, that is a, uh, that's a good question posed. I mean, especially with the San Diego State uh, exit that looked like that was going to happen. I wondered, and I've never, I have not talked to the commissioner or anybody, but I did wonder in the back of my mind, if San Diego State leaves, are they going to want us to come in, uh, you know, with our other sports perhaps, you know, to, to supplement the basketball scheduling and things of that nature? Uh, you know, we, we, we do pay a, sub, a travel subsidy in the, in the Big West, so that our, those teams can afford to come over and play us. I guess if we left to go to the, all in on the Mountain West, we would probably use that same travel subsidy even for either for ourselves or maybe to the conference, but to 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 uh, engage in that travel. But the Mountain West travel would be a little bit more difficult because you're going out to Wyoming, you're going out to Denver, you're going farther into the into the continent rather than just the coast, the uh, the California coast that we do right now. So the travel costs would go up a little bit. Whether that travel subsidy that we would get back from the big West that we're providing would go to that. I don't know. So, uh, and I'm not sure, you know, I think, I think the big West is probably better in some of these outdoor sports like baseball, softball, uh, certainly volleyballs because uh, men's volleyball at least, because I don't think they have that in the mountain West, but some of those sports are probably better in the mountain West. Now I'm sure basketball maybe, and others might be, uh, I'm sorry, be better in the big West, but I'm sure basketball may be better, better in the mountain West. Uh, but you know, the Pac-12 is always out there, too. I know that that's been talked about over the years. I, I, I wish we had that new Aloha Stadium right now to trot out to the, the Pac-12, for example, if they start losing members and they're looking for replacements. But I think we have to just be as good as we can here. Because if you look at conference uh, expansion, and I followed that when I was in the American Conference, and they just basically took Cincinnati and, and uh, you know, Houston – uh, UCF out of our, the conference I was in for, for many, many years out there. Uh, you know what it all comes down to is football. You know, West Virginia is in the ACC because of football. Uh, football drives everything in college athletics and it drives everything in, in, in expansion. Uh, and so we've just got to be really good in football and our other sports, but especially in football, uh, to be a real, uh, a real draw. I mean, I'm sure when June Jones was winning – uh, and going to Sugar Bowl in 2007, I believe. I mean, if they would have done conference expansion there, I'm sure we would have been top of the top of the heap there, you know. So football is very important to to for the draw uh, for conference affiliation. But we have to be prepared to try to maximize our opportunities whenever that may may be. And whether whether it's better to stay where we are, better to take other sports in the Mountain West, or eventually maybe try to go to the Pac-12, I don't know yet. But we uh, but we're gonna we're gonna monitor the landscape. But we're going to be as best as we can right now so that we're attractive uh, if an opportunity comes up. You know, I'm interested you talking about enhancing the fan experience on campus in a variety of ways. I think a lot of folks got really used to watching games on television through the pandemic. And so you have people who are not the really hardcore UH fans, but maybe attended a game or two throughout the year. How do you get those folks to come back to campus, to come fill the seats again? What are you going to do to engage the more casual fans who can still uh, bring a lot of enthusiasm and, and of course, revenue uh, to the school? Yeah, yeah. And that's that, you know, that's our goal. But also it's our challenge, too, because we have a 15,300 foot, uh, uh, 15,300 seat stadium now. And after you provide uh, comp tickets to the to the band and to the students and to the visiting team and the home team students and whatnot, you're probably able to sell about, let's say, 13,000 seats. So really, you're only able to th sell 13,000 seats. Now, hopefully we can do that. Uh, and, and we have a long waiting list. If we have a great product, I think that will eventually help. But but yeah, I mean, I think we're trying to be real proactive in our selling of season tickets. We're trying to create packages. Eventually, we'll eventually sell uh, single game tickets starting, the, say, starting April 1st. Uh, I'm sorry, August 1st. But also trying to theme our games, trying to trying to attract people here. I, today, I, I met with four-star general, uh, uh, Army General Flynn, who has, has his command. Uh, and uh, we were talking briefly about how can we, you know, also involve involve our our military we've got a lot of military here i mean all kinds of promotions and things like that to try to get as many people in the crowd as possible but but yeah i mean most we'll be able to sell is thirteen thousand seats 
uh, hopefully we, you know, they'll, they're able to watch the game on spectrum. Uh, and then hopefully we can win. If we can do those three things, get as many people in the seats, have them watch the game on spectrum and also uh, win, then I think our fan base will continue to go up. I know the, the experience of tailgating and things like that has been curtailed quite severely since being here, but we're looking at parking options and maybe tailgating options too, to maybe bring back some of that. So just trying to see whatever we can do to, to find the right, the right formula to get our people here. We're trying to do. Well, we know a lot of fans will be happy to hear that there may be some tailgating opportunities because that definitely was a big part of the experience at Aloha Stadium. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, we are all out of time. We could have spent another half an hour speaking to you, but this is uh, we have some time limitations. So we thank you so much for spending your Friday morning with us and uh, best, of luck, uh, best of luck to you uh, as you enter into this fall sports season. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. Great. Thank you for having me. Let's do it again sometime. Aloha. Thanks. Yes, please. Right. Mahalo. Well, great to hear from him. His first time here on Spotlight Hawaii, five weeks on the job. And wow, what a long list of things to accomplish. You know, his primary goal, he says, of course, is increasing the revenue. You heard him talk about that throughout having breakfast, lunch, dinner and reception to meet with all the prominent donors in town uh, and anyone who may be able to help the program. And, and really talking about even selling his own uh, athletics director box so that they can increase the revenue, just trying to increase that as much as possible, given the limitations of only having you know 15,300 seats in the stadium now yeah and really just you heard from him sharing his vision about some of the facilities saying that uh, he uh, is pretty confident in the facilities that are there that you know of course uh, the Stan Sheriff Center as well as Les Morcani Stadium and uh, the different other venues that are on campus that might need a little sprucing up uh, but uh, overall maybe focusing more on Clum Gym and a performance center in order to stay competitive with the uh, other athletic programs in the country uh, I can say as someone who was a former assistant coach uh, that, you know, worked for the University of Hawaii. Uh, there were moments where the facilities weren't top notch and, the, you know, the athletic department has gone uh, under some massive renovations over the years to really stay up to date with uh, the other competitive programs throughout the country when it comes to the training room facilities and just uh, a lot of things have happened on that lower campus over the last few years. And so his vision continuing to enhance that and trying to find opportunities to make sure that the University of Hawaii does stay competitive within that area and that arena. Uh, he also touched in uh, on NIL, the name, image, and likeness, and how that is impacting college athletics throughout the country and also here in Hawaii. Uh, and some of the challenges that go on with just trying to match the bottom line with corporate sponsorships, of course, being key to the University of Hawaii Athletic Department and that community's uh, support and finding that balance and uh, sharing that message to those donors saying, uh, you know, hey, we want you to continue to support the program. We want you to continue to support the athletes, but also recognizing that there may be limitations with the overall budget. So really trying to find ways to uh, find potentially new donors or find different experiences to ensure that those corporate donors uh, are able to keep uh, supporting the athletics department at the level that it has been. Yeah, and interesting to hear his notes on the fan experience there. A lot of enhancements that he hopes to bring, including possibly bringing back tailgating. We saw some of the comments there this morning asking if that was going to be a possibility. So hang tight. It does sound like that could happen, and that could bring a lot of enthusiasm to campus as well. Uh, on Monday, Ryan, we've got a, a guest who always has a lot of questions and who loves to talk. That's why we're going to be going to Honolulu Hale and catching up with Honolulu Mayor Rick Blangiardi. Of course, a big week uh, for the city last week with the launching of Skyline. His thoughts on the inaugural run and how things are going there with the new rail line. We'll also catch up on some of the developments and the conversations happening with the city budget overall that he recently signed and uh, the dynamics that continues to exist with the city council members. Always a lot to talk about. We'll also be hearing from former Honolulu Mayor Kirk Caldwell, who has a book. He will yeah. be joining Spotlight on Wednesday. Uh, I have we it have here. We got to read it. <laughs> copy. We both uh, have our copies here. Our beaches were empty. Our hospitals were full. Very interesting book that he's written. Uh, we're looking forward to catching up with former Honolulu Mayor Kirk Caldwell. Yeah, that's right. And we'll also be joined by the governor next week. So a busy week. Uh, we hope you have a great weekend. We'll see you right back here on Monday with Mayor Blanche Giardi. Until then, have a great weekend and aloha. Aloha.